Good afternoon and welcome to everybody who's joined us for um, the two outstanding talks that we have for this afternoon. Um, again, this is a little different from our usual uh, EPI research day, which is held in a big room with lots of people, um, all closely not social distancing. Um, but uh, given the circumstances, uh, hopefully you've enjoyed what we put together for today so far with the, uh, the team set up. Um, looks like it's gone well this morning. Appreciate any feedback you may want to give us. Hopefully we won't need to do it this way again, but I do think there are some potential advantages to, uh, to having a virtual setup. Um, I would note that for the talks this afternoon, uh, if you have questions, you can go ahead and type them in at any time. And what I'll do is select some questions uh, to show up on the you know, published area. And people who like those questions, if you could indicate you like them, and then we'll, we'll that'll help prioritize the questions we'll ask at the end of the talks. Uh, we'll see how our time goes. Hopefully, if there is time after each talk, we will ask uh, at least a few questions. So again, welcome. Thanks for being here. I would note that we've got, uh, I believe at last count, some 330 or some odd individuals who are registered for the meeting. Um, so um, there are a lot of people who've been involved. And again, uh, welcome and glad you're here. So our first talk uh, is by Dr. Andrew Dobson. Uh, Andy Dobson is an ecologist whose research focuses on the role that pathogens and diseases play in natural ecosystems. He uses a mixture of field work, mathematical models, and data analysis. He's worked on conservation and disease issues in, uh, the, in the Serengeti, Tanzania, and Yellowstone for the past 30 years. He also works on emerging pathogens and the ecological and economic conditions that lead to these outbreaks. He has long-term interests in the evolution of social systems in primates, elephants, and carnivores, and how this impacts the population dynamics of their interactions with parasites and human ex uh, exploitation. He uh, has been on the faculty at Princeton since 1990 in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And um, he is also external faculty at the Santa Fe Institute, where he works on problems and complexity. Uh, it is with great pleasure that uh, we welcome Dr. Dr. Dobson. Thank you. It's a great honor to have been invited. It's a great pleasure and a tragedy uh, not to be there in person, but I, I will try and be as much as myself as possible uh, at a distance, so as to speak. Uh, I'm just going to put my slides up, uh, which I think I just about have the technical ability to do after all my training. Yep, here we are. OK. You should now be able to see a slide that says preventing the next pandemic, ecology, economics and evolution, which is the title of my talk. And it's going to be roughly divided into three sections corresponding to those three E's. Initially, I'll talk about what are the mechanisms that lead to new pathogens emerging and, and then focus in on, on two of those three mechanisms. I'll then cover some of the economic costs of things we could do to prevent emerging diseases occurring, such as we're seeing today with COVID, and compare those costs with the costs of the first six months or so of COVID. So up until, if you like, the end of June, July last year, with one extrapolation to the beginning of this year. Finally, I'll talk about a sort of question that, that's increasingly worrying me about what do we know about the evolution of emerging pathogens? Uh, and there's only one or two systems where we've looked at the evolution of emerging pathogens in any detail because mostly we've been lucky and eradicated them. But there's one that we were not worried about enough to uh, do anything about the control so we can look and study its evolution and see what's happened naturally to that and hopefully take some slightly disconcerting lessons for COVID from that study. Now, just over a year and two months ago, I think it was around the 30th of November, I was getting, 30th of December 2019, I was uh, getting re ready to uh, withstand the chaos of my son's annual New Year's party, uh, getting the house sort of clean, ready for uh, the mess that would happen to it, when I received this sort of discouraged certing 
uh, email from ProMed. And it was about the market, the, the market I just showed you a picture of, suggesting that people who'd been visiting that market in Wuhan, China, was showing some unusual disease syndromes. And a couple of us chatted about it. They're also up late preparing for children's parties the next, the next night. And we said, I don't think this is going to be such a problem. It sounds to me as if it's a lot like SARS, which in many ways we were correct, but SARS had been a relatively easy disease to, control, to contain and control. It was a huge economic impact, but we quickly worked out what the problems were. So our initial feeling on that first sort of 24, 48 hours about COVID was this might be a problem. We should get on top of it. And things were motivated to do that. But if it's like SARS, we'll know what to do. And our principal insight there was the thing with SARS is that transmission only seems to kick off once people start showing symptoms. And because COVID or this new thing seemed to be like SARS, we felt that's okay, we'll quickly get a handle on this one. We couldn't, as we now know, have been more wrong. Now, it was a wonderful or horrendous example of what is essentially a by annual or twice a year event, the emergence of new viral pathogens. And this is a draft that my friend Mark Woolhouse at the University of Edinburgh has been putting together and adding to each year. It's the rate at which new virus species are reported from humans. And you'll notice the early years, the 1920s, we didn't really have a good idea of what a virus was. It was just something that causes diseases that could pass through a filter. Increasingly, we had the ability to identify things as viruses, mainly RNA viruses, but also DNA viruses. Once the technology settled down, we were roughly seeing two new viruses recorded from humans every year. You know, Mark first published this grant back at the beginning of the century. So knowing that we get new viruses should not be a surprise to them. We could put some of the superstar new viruses on this graph. Here I've put on HIV-1, which had caused a global pandemic right at the beginning of my academic career. I put on SARS, Zika virus, which was first recorded back in the 1960s, but didn't cause a major pandemic until about three years ago, 2017, and of course COVID. So to a rough approximation, we get two new viruses every year, just about every four to six years, we get one that starts a pandemic or an epidemic that with luck we manage to control. But no surprises, you essentially get a new disease that's going to cause major problems, roughly the same rate as you get a new president in the United States, a new prime minister in, in Europe, or a new president in any other of the world's countries. They're not unusual, they're scarily regular. And the bottom line of what I'm going to say is really we should be much prepared, better prepared to deal with this because we've seen how huge the economic cost of not being prepared is and what the cost of mismanaging these things is. Now, round about 2008, a group of us were lucky enough to have some very bright postdocs and we said, let's do a review of the early stages of new pathogens crossing over. And this paper was headed up by, by Jamie Lloyd Smith. It, it was good for all of the postdocs because they've all ended up with very good faculty jobs. They've all now got tenure. But essentially, we could divide the different stages into things transmitting in the wild and not crossing over, occasional spillover events, which we, we usually don't detect very well because we tend to think it's something else that people have got, often malaria, often flu. So we don't really catch it people are isolated and it tends to die out. And occasionally we get things that start starting, starting trickling chains of transmission, either in humans or, or in domestic livestock, which then spills over into humans. If we looked at that time at where the papers were being published, there are a lot of sort of natural history, Journal of Wildlife Disease type background papers of people looking at pathogens in wildlife. And, and so we do know quite a lot but I would posit that maybe we know maybe about less than 1% of what we really need to know about the diversity of pathogens circulating in the wild that might be future COVIDs. There are uh, a couple of handfuls of papers on cross-species spillover, 
There are even less papers on limited human to human transmission of rare things we haven't seen before that then go extinct. And then, as I say, papers on pathogen evolution, which were very rare indeed, rare as unicorns almost, because you know, if these things go extinct, we're not going to see evolution in the first two or three cases of transmission. Still, it suggested there was lots more to be done. Well, recently, over last summer, we, we, we published some paper on the economics, and we're now following up with a paper that's under interminably long review, a wonderful uh, testimony to the, the speed and efficiency with which the scientific process works, that it now splits this uh, spillover in, into six different stages from pre-emergence, which is cycling in the wild, the actual process of pathogen spillover and, and how we can focus that on more detail, emergence and the use of syndromic surveillance to look at things, localized transmission, beginning to spread to global spread. And, and what the point of this talk is, is to focus in on some of these areas to then allow us to do some costing of how much it costs to stop these things early on versus the costs of doing things at a later stage when we're right over on the right hand side. So let's kick off by talking about the ecology of emerging pathogens. There, the two major ecological causes are agricultural intensification, particularly tropical deforestation, which leads to habitat fragmentation, and the people working in those fragments get exposed to things they haven't been exposed to before, they get sick and start uh, transmitting. Secondly, is, is the role of the wildlife trade. And, and what's now, increasingly, we think COVID is tied in with this, uh, but it may also be that SARS originally was as well. Now, if we look at patterns of global, emer uh, uh, global emergence, going back over the last four or 500 years, we see that pathogens have emerged all over the world. And, and, and there's a sort of, almost a sort of business of trying to predict where pathogens will occur by producing maps of where they've occurred, uh, appeared in the past. I, I think that's a useful exercise, but it's a useless predictive tool. Uh, all you're actually doing is making very detailed maps of where people are working on infectious diseases. There are huge blank areas on those maps where nobody's working, and that points to a bigger problem. The maps are also, I think, misleading in that politicians and the people who make decisions are really good at reading maps because they use them to plan their holidays when they sneak off from Texas, say to Cancun or, or decide to invade some country. Politicians are pretty useless at looking at graphs and even worse at looking at genetic data. So that means they much rather look at something that was foggy and misrepresentative because they think they understand it, but something that's clear to a scientist, but not clear to a politician. That being said, we can see pathogens have popped up all over the place. What are the underlying signatures of this? Well, one of the interesting underlying signatures, okay, is that, hey, these can steal the political agenda from some people and pretending there aren't such things as emerging pathogens is one of the things that's got us into this really bad situation we're in today. If you look back a year, and see the sort of things that the White House was saying about denying even the existence of this pathogen, that added hugely to the more than half a million people who have died in the last 12 months because of this pathogen. Now, what is one of the patterns we see? Well, a really intriguing pattern is lots of these pathogens appear to be associated with bats as a reservoir host. If we look at Ebola, the finger points very strongly to different bat species being the reservoir hosts of, of Ebola and people being exposed to those bats or kids hiding in hollowed out trees where bats are pooping or peeing is exposing those kids to those viruses. We see similar things. We know if we go all the way back that the bats are the likely reservoir of rabies. Uh, MERS in the Middle East probably was in a bat before it got in, in, into camels. Uh, the two of the scariest things, the Nipah virus and Hendra virus, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute, both have fruit bats as their reservoirs. And SARS, we know, and COVID both have bats as their reservoir species. Now, here is a wonderful bat. This is a teropid fruit bat. It's a megatropterum, one of the, the big, the, the family of the big diurnal bats that spend their time uh, very socially living together in big roosts and feeding predominantly on fruit in fruit trees. 
if we look at the range of the teropid bats, they're circled in green here. It's essentially much of the far east, right down through India and across to Madagascar and some of the Indian Ocean islands. There are a sister genera of bats, the Eidolon bats, that are in Africa. And the one place they really overlap are Madagascar and a little bit in India. But we know these are the reservoir hosts to some pretty nasty viruses. And we had the interesting emergence of two of those in the 1990s. This is a really interesting place. This is ground zero, if you like, for Nipah virus, a, 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 a respiratory transmitted pathogen that's endemic in fruit bats in the Malaysian peninsula. The, the village of Ipoh is about halfway down that peninsula. This is the pig farm where the first recorded outbreak of that pathogen occurred. You see they put cutting edge uh, preventative measures in place. There's, there's a sign that's almost spelt correctly, but what they did was to go in and totally destroy the pig barn, killing all the pigs in there. And as I'll show you, eventually killing all the pigs in Mal on the Malaysian Peninsula to prevent this disease spilling over into humans. Two people here. This is Dr. K.W. Chang, who was the physician who first identified uh, the presence of Nipah when the farm workers on this particular pig farm started coming down with a weird disease syndrome. In the background, you'll see a curious person. This is Peter Dezak, who appears again here. Uh, Peter heads up the EcoHealth Alliance. Peter and I had a grant in, in 2000 to spend five years looking at Nipah virus and Hendra virus, working with a fantastic group of people to see what could we learn about emergence of these pathogens in Malaysia uh, and, and Australia. Uh, and Peter here is somebody with somebody you almost never get to see. This is literally patient zero in the Nipah virus outbreak. This guy got really sick. Luckily, he went to Dr. Chang and they managed to treat him and he recovered, but he also infected several members of his family and several of the other co-workers at the pig farm also got infected, the mortality rate is about 45 to 55%. So Nipah virus is a really scary virus. With Jonathan Epstein, who at that time was, was a graduate student working for the EcoHealth Alliance, we went and misnetted and surveyed lots of teropid bats all around the Malaysian Peninsula, taking blood samples and looking at the serology, how many of these bats had been exposed to Nipah virus, the black in the circles tells you what the level of infection is. Pretty much more than half of the bats in the area have been exposed to Nipah virus. Now the interesting thing about these viruses is they have almost no pathology in the bats. And that's one of the disconcerting things. Something causes the pathology of these viruses to change once they move from being in a bat to being in a pig or a human. And that's probably something to do with the host that the virus is expressing itself in because the virus itself genetically has not changed from when it's in a bat, from when it's in a human or a pig. How does it get there? Well, this is the transmission route. This is a bat eating a mango. And the more astute amongst you will realize that that bat can't eat all of that mango. The way it eats it is just to bite the pith off suck all the nice uh, sucroses and fruity juices out of it and then drop the, 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 the pit down below wherever it happens to be eating it. And that was the problem in Ipo because when the pig industry started in the Malaysian Peninsula, mango trees, most of the pig barns were built under uh, already present mango trees or mango trees were planted to provide shelter for the pig barns and they provided great shelter from the really hot Malaysian sun, but they also provided a fruit source for the bats, whilst at the same time, the forest is being destroyed to make palm oil uh, plantations. So there was less and less places for the bats to go, and the places the bats went were literally the trees, the branches of the trees above the pig barns. They eat the mangoes, they don't eat them properly, they just chew on them, spit them out, they drop down, and the pigs eat them, well, hey, you have set off transmission. 
So this was the study beautifully worked out by one of the graduate students on the project, Juliet Pulliam, who, who, who worked with me at Princeton and, and I think graced your institute in, in Florida for four or five years after she finished. She is now in South Africa and is very much at the center of the COVID control operations within South Africa. And what Juliet found was really interesting. A, there's a very strong mapping of mango density onto pig density. Agricultural intensification of two different crops forced together and mixing species together, which wouldn't normally mix. If you look at these industries taking off, the, the dashed line is mango production, the solid line is pig production. Once Nipah takes off, all oh, a huge number of pigs are destroyed. Both industries essentially collapse. Now, a really brilliant piece of detective work by Juliet managed to get the information from different pig barns and start looking at what happens with outbreaks of Nipah virus. And what she showed, if you looked at when the dates at which pigs started getting sick, there was quite an interesting effect that there was a huge epidemic in 1999, the thing that led to the killing of all the pigs and the collapse of the pig industry. But prior to that, over the previous two years, there'd been little outbreaks that kept appearing, pigs were slaughtered, and then the thing would seem to die out. Now, if we make a model of this, which Juliet did for her thesis, you'll notice that there's quite a profound effect epidemiologically between an initial introduction of an infected mango into a pig bar and a subsequent introduction. The initial out introduction causes an outbreak which infects quite a lot of pigs, quite a lot of pigs die or are killed. The pigs that survive become resistant, they're breeding pigs, they're left in there to produce more pigs. So when you get a second epidemic, it's much less dramatic, but it lasts much longer. Essentially, with these high transmissible aerosol transmitted viruses that create immunity, the presence of immunity changes the characteristic of the host population and flips it being from one where you get a violent epidemic that dies out because it runs out of susceptibles and a less violent epidemic that persists for much, much longer because the R0 is lower which means that the rate of spread is slower and can last for much longer. And that's an important insight that will obviously also come into effect as we start vaccinating people with COVID. The dynamics are going to change and persistence will take over from epidemics as the way a pathogen works. The third graduate student on the project was Raina Plowright, who's now faculty at the uh, University of Montana in Bozeman. She was looking at Hendra virus in Australia, which again has the Australian teropid bats as its reservoir species. These live in camps, not with tents, but they're, they're, they're called camps by the Australians. They're huge populations or aggregations of fruit bats living in trees in different areas. It's sometimes in the, you know, if you go to Brisbane University, they're right in the middle of campus. They're around people's farms. Hendra virus was first reported in racehorses because again, bats were living in a tree left to give shade on a horse barn. They were dropping fruit down. The horses were eating it. These were really expensive race horses. Racehorse trainers and vets were sent out. And the first two or three people killed by Hendra in Australia were, were racehorse uh, vets looking after the racehorses. Initially, it was thought it was the same pathogen as we'd seen in Malaysia. But the genetic work showed that these are two very closely related and similar viruses, but, but distinct, but with very similar pathology, particularly when they get into humans or horses or pigs and negligible pathology in fruit bats. Rainer's work showed very similar effects to Juliet's. If you set up epidemics of Hendra in horse populations of different sizes, depending on the proportion that are initially immune, if you have no immune hosts, then you get a very dramatic epidemic that dies out really quite quickly. This is the persistence time in red, size of the epidemic in black. As the proportion of immune hosts increases, the size of the epidemic goes down, but the duration goes up. So again, there's always for any infectious disease, a trade-off between the size of the initial epidemic and the length of time the thing lasts for once it becomes endemic. 
And Juliet did a fantastic paper on that. A wonderful example. If you want to keep something secret, publish it. But essentially, you can show if you compare the relate the relationship between the ratio of duration of infection is to duration of immunity on the x axis so the longer you're infectious relative to immunity versus r naught there's a region where a second infection into a population will persist and regions where it won't and a whole range of different pathogens measles rubella pandemic influenza sars all have these characteristics so it's a very deep and important insight now let's look at the other mechanism, uh, tropical deforestation, well, another aspect of this, the tropical deforestation. This is Rondonia in Brazil, and hopefully this graphic will work. It worked yesterday, yep, should do. Okay, this is around the time I started my academic career, 1983. Rondonia was continuous forest. Over the next 25 years, Roads are put in, forest is put, chopped down, people move in, and slowly what was originally continuous forest is chopped into lots of fragments of different sizes with, uh, on the periphery, huge amounts of soy agriculture and small farms throughout the middle of it. Oops. This fragmentation effect is global. It's going on in all the major tropical regions of the world. In some, it, it's almost completely gone. But if we go, say, to Central Africa and look at patterns of fragmentation around the Central African forests, then all of the outbreaks of Ebola occur in these areas of fragmentation. If we just step back and look at levels of fragmentation of the Amazon at the current time or fragmentation of the Central African forests, these are ongoing and creating these problems of emerging diseases. Indeed, in a paper we had out about a month ago, headed up by Tom Gillespie, these are patterns of deforestation and fragmentation. These are a whole range of different pathogens that have emerged because of this, from hantavirus, laser fever, Ebola, Kyanosaur forest disease, Nipah virus. This fragmentation and loss of rainforest is at the core of these emerging events. So it meant that a group of us decided to get together initially at NCS, the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis in Santa Barbara, the type of center we need if we're going to do research on stuff like this, tragically closed down or mothballed by NSF because uh, they thought it had lived its useful course. So we continued the work at CISIC, which is in, in Annapolis and focuses on environmental problems of particular pertinence to humans. But again, both places, we need more places like that if we're going to deal with these viruses and other environmental problems and how to deal with them. What we were interested in is initially making models and gathering data for habitat fragmentation and disease emergence. And we had a fantastic group of people for this, most of whom are, on, are named on this paper. One of the simplest ways you can think of this is to say, well, what processes are going on as we destroy tropical forests? Well, essentially what happens is you have a continuous green area, which you gradually erode by chopping it down, burning it, and it creates a matrix area, which you can use for agriculture, though often it's relatively only useful for agriculture for two or three years. So that increases. And what you have is the boundary between those two areas which is some sort of function that will already be at a peak at roughly 50% and obviously zero when it's in tight intact forest, zero when it's completely converted. The more fractal the boundary, the higher and higher the, this peak or the perimeter where transmission can occur from the forest species into the matrix species can occur. Models of that, we, we can divide the, the wonderful world of diseases of which we have far too little biological knowledge in, in, into two types of diseases. Density dependent transmitted diseases, which would be things like Ebola, Nipah virus, uh, the ones I've talked about, or vector borne diseases, which tend to have frequency dependent transmission. In either case, depending on the relative rates within and between species, uh, within the matrix and between matrix species and forest species, Peak transmission always occurs at rough levels of 50% conversion of habitat. That's relatively intuitive. What's less intuitive 
is if you redo that calculation as a stochastic calculation, trying to look at what is the relative size of the epidemic. And there are the two important points I want to sort of point to are uh, the middle panel here that says your probability of getting an outbreak occurs somewhere between about 15 to 20 percent of conversion and 80 to 85 percent of conversion. The relative size of that outbreak peaks not at 50 percent when the risk is highest, but more like 80 to 90 percent, because that's when you've got the biggest ratio of, of sort of population in the matrix to, to, to population in the remaining patch of habitat times risk of transmission. So effectively, the size of the epidemic produced is much, much bigger, even when you think you're past that safe maximum perimeter point. And indeed, if you look at relative size at frequency distribution of epidemics, they're small early on, consistent and quite large in the middle. This is a log scale and either small or massive once you get to about 90% conversion. And tragically, with what we're doing to the Amazon, what we've already done to Southeast Asia, we're somewhere between 50 and 90%. So we really are in the scary area. We could try and look at the type of hosts we should be worried about. And this really is a fishing exercise because for many of the big groups of mammals that are potential reservoir hosts, we simply don't have enough data. Our biggest worry is bats and the global diversity of bats is highest in Brazil. We haven't seen an emergence of anything from bats into South America yet, uh, uh, other than rabies, which occurs quite regularly. But we have seen that consistently throughout Africa and Southeast America. Again, this illustrates stuff we need to do and helps make this point that the maps are not very useful from a predictive sense. We need to do science in a different way of which to understand more about disease emergence rather than just making maps. Now, what about the wildlife trade? Anyone who's been to Southeast Asia and, and, and taken their uh, courage and gone to some of these wildlife uh, wet markets, they're pretty scary places with all sorts of weird things for sale, uh, much of which just goes to luxury restaurants for people to eat at bachelor or bachelorette parties or at weddings. So it's not food that's feeding people who are hungry and desperately need food. In fact, we want to divide it when we think about it, the wildlife trade into two areas. There's the international wildlife trade, which is very, very much luxury trade that you know, the world could easily live without. And local trade, which often, because of other decisions, is the only thing people have available to, to eat. And so solving these two different aspects of the wildlife trade are two very different problems. If we look at the international trade, these are data collected by CITES, the Convention for International Trade in Endangered Species. These are purely just data for Singapore because Singapore is an Ill interesting illustration of how CITES works. We feel it's a relatively honest country compared to lots of the other countries have signed up to, to, to Singapore. Singapore also doesn't have any of its own biodiversity. It's a tiny island with a few parks for people to go and take exercise in. So none of these transactions have anything to do with this diversity that's in Singapore. I've illustrated the data for two countries. On, on the left is the United States, and these are just transactions. Uh, packages, uh, containers, you, if you like, or parcels of stuff registered to CITES that is passed through Singapore going to the United States. And literally, when you look at the species names, this is stuff from all over the world. Singapore is a real hub for the wildlife trade. Two things you see in this figure is one, CITES was set up in 1975-76, so you see the initial growth of CITES up to being relatively maximum efficiency by about 1982-85. There are then consistently of the order of 10,000 packages or transactions of wildlife to the United States. The majority of Appendix 2 and 3 species, a small proportion of Appendix 1, the most endangered species due to trade in wildlife. The one disconcerting thing about CITES is you start off in Appendix 3 as being registered and slightly concerned and quickly make your way up to Appendix 1. I've contrasted this with China. 
because you still see the initial growth of the wildlife trade as CITES begins to, to, to uh, develop its, the mechanisms to work. You then see steady growth of trade into China from the rest of the world. Subtly different species, but a significant overlap because it's all luxury crap for people to play around with as toys and for their own egos. Notice, even though it represents mainly the growth and power of the Chinese economy, it is still an order of magnitude less than the amount of stuff going into the United States. So to point the finger at China and say they're really bad about this is wrong. They're bad, but they're 10 times less bad than the US. So we need to do a lot more to stop this trade because it's a major threat to biodiversity and a huge risk for future pandemics. The annual budget for CITES is $5 million. It's paid for by 183 countries. $5 million paid for by 183 countries. Usually lots of them forget or don't send all the money. So this year's budget was under 2 million because most people didn't send their money because they were too worried about COVID. It's like saying, well, don't let's pay for the, uh, the CVS pharmacy because we're really worried about getting our drugs. It couldn't be a more pathetic international situation of how badly the world cooperates on things like trade that threatens biodiversity and creates major threats for infectious diseases. The other type of data we need to look at, and this will be from this forthcoming paper, is what is the rate people in the wildlife trade are exposed? And so these are data from within Southeast Asia, within China, people working in the trade and, and working with the Eco Health Alliance people, just going out with them and taking blood samples from either the bats they're working with uh, in the trade or monkeys, macaques in this case, this is, I think, one of the scariest graphs I've ever seen. It essentially says each sample is a new animal they've sampled. The y-axis is a novel viral species that no one's seen before. And if you're working in the wildlife trade, you're easily going to be handling three or four hundred species of bats a year. That means you're exposed to 40 or 50 viruses that no one's seen before. If you're working with monkeys, which is to me is the egregious aspect of you know, who was going to eat a monkey, the people in the trade are exposed to up to 200 viruses we've never seen before. And that's a disaster waiting to happen. And it's exactly what we did see happen about 18 months ago. Some of this led to COVID coming across, but it leads to all sorts of weird questions. If these guys are being exposed to this level of novel viruses, why aren't more things coming across? Were we really unlucky? Or have these people got such high levels of immunity because they're exposed to so many other things that they're an effective barrier against things coming across? And it's not until these things are passed live into the markets or the holding facilities that we get this transmission to other species that lead to these outbreaks. But plainly, we need to know much more about this. And indeed, what this level of unknown viruses says is we need to set up a global database of viruses a global virome project, so as we know more about what's out there that might be future threats. And the cost of that would be less than the cost of putting the little toy cart on Mars last week. No one's ever going to benefit from that toy cart on Mars other than the egos of a couple of physicists and people who want to stay up late watching TV because they're in isolation. Putting similar amounts of money into understanding global viral diversity, we now know will be a benefit to everybody on the planet. Particularly understanding what goes on in bats and why a bat different. What causes the immune system of bats to interact with these viruses in different ways than other mammals? And that's something I'm not going to talk about in any detail, but there's a couple of reviews here with a, another fantastic student, Cara Brook, who, who starts in the fall at the University of Chicago as a faculty member, where She's found deeply interesting differences between the way bats immunity works and the other mammal immunity works. So what's the economics of all of this? Well, you could go back and say, well, what if we do a cost benefit analysis for interventions, stopping the wildlife trade, reducing tropical deforestation? And how does that compare with the cost of COVID? Uh, we did this, we started to do this, I should say, last 
Springs shortly after COVID appeared. Uh, this is the classic sort of fisheries biology table, uh, which we can convert at least into a bar chart, where these are costs in millions of dollars on the y-axis we've got the pathetic five million cost of CITES monitoring the trade expanding that to early detection but by hiring more veterans or, or, or essentially using things like the predict project that NIH had to look for viruses in other hosts better livestock management under FAO reducing deforestation which we've got three different costings for but of course, when you reduce deforestation, and then this is based on the cost of reducing deforestation in the early years of the century in the Amazon, when a sort of functional Brazilian government did great things to slow it down. You also have CO2 benefits to that because we desperately need that forest to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and slow climate change. Uh, so there's benefits of doing that. Uh, there are benefits to doing all of these things and ending the wild meat trade within China, which turns out is a huge business, but China has already been very good on curtailing that and, and reducing it back down. We compare that, so this is you know, up to 20,000, so, so that's of the order of $2 billion. If we look at that and compare it to the damages, we've got the loss of global GDP, and this is only up until May last year, when essentially we had six trillion dollars loss of GDP estimated uh, due to COVID and the number of people who've died, which you have to estimate in three different ways because different countries estimate that the cost of people dying different ages in different ways. We can compare that, the, the, the cost of COVID up until May last year with the cost of prevention, this is all of those costs, this little red dot. The big purple square is the 11 trillion loss due to COVID. Reduction in GDP globally and the cost of the deaths. We can expand that red up to, up to just to have boxes of different sizes for disease detection, ending the meat trade in China, monitoring wildlife. By the time we get to the end of the year, the costs in the little red box haven't changed at all. It still costs the same to do that. The purple square covers the entire screen. We now think that COVID has crossed the global economy $30 trillion. And that cost is going to go on for the next five to eight years. Whatever the loonies who only look at the stock market to see how the global economy is doing tell you. So how else would we spend that? Well, one important thing is there's again a delusion that the frontline troops are the medical people. Actually, the people that we need out there to detect diseases are usually veterinarians. They're the people who see the sick livestock. They're the people who work with the wildlife disease people to identify animals with weird infections. If we plot out a graph of population size, see these are data from FAO, the, the part of the UN that deals with animal health, against the number of veterinary staff in all the world's countries, with, with two exceptions, or three exceptions actually, you can see there's a pretty strong linear relationship that, that, that's actually got a slope of less than one on a log log scale. So, so there are proportionately less vets in the larger countries. The more interesting information is the scatter around the line. There are essentially two orders of magnitude of scatter around that line. You can see the US is up here above the global average, but roughly on the par with Australia and Brazil in terms of number of vets per non-vet in the population, uh, uh, around the, the order of, of two to 3,000 people per vet. Roughly this less, about half as many as in Canada or Mongolia, and a quarter of the numbers that Spain has. Uh, if you have a sick pet, the best place to be in the world is St. Martin in the Caribbean, which doesn't even fit on this graph, but that seems to have huge numbers of vets. The big worry is all the countries below the line. Most of those are in Africa, Southeast Asia. That's where we're seeing emerging diseases coming out, and there are no frontline troops there to be able to identify them. So we desperately need massive increase in training in people going and learning veterinary skills because we need people trained in interdisciplinary and multi-species medicine, not just more 
pre-meds who want to go and study the knees of great athletes. This is a huge thing we need to have to get going. So let's finish off by talking about evolution of emerging pathogens. The big question is, will COVID become more or less virulent? And I'm in California at the moment. All the newspapers are full about more virulent strains. How, how is this going to work? And can we get insights on this? Whoops. Well, one of the dumbest insights we had was putting a religious fanatic in charge of understanding coronavirus. Why would you put a religious fanatic in trying to understand a problem in evolution? This cartoon came out almost exactly a year ago when it was announced that this person who never appeared in a press conference for nine months was going to be in charge of the nation's COVID task force. As the virus said, this is going to be easy. There was nobody there to stop them. The house was empty effectively. What have we seen so far? And uh, well, what we've seen, this would be around September last year, when most of the genetic change in COVID is essentially neutral. We're not seeing variation, we're just seeing mutations that are giving rise to things so as we can map how the pathogen spread around the world. And we can see that in the US, initially, it probably came in from China, but most of the strains that are circulating in the US by April, May, all came in from Europe rather than China. So stopping transport from China, even though it was done too late, really wasn't very effective as most of the stuff was coming in from Europe. Now, what's this? This is one of my favorite birds. This is a house finch. If, if I look out the window in California, I can see some on the feeder. In California, they're in their native range. Where I live in New Jersey, they're the commonest birds on the feeders in my backyard, but they're an introduced species there. The natural habitat is actually the deserts of the, the Southwest, where I'll be next week. But I'm used to seeing them on my feeders. They were introduced into Long Island in 1940. So there are, if you like, an introduced species in the Eastern US and a resident species in the Western US. Their population took a while to grow, but when it did, it started to expand rapidly in the East. So these are data from the Lab of Ornithology in Cornell. And then 1993, something weird happened. Notice that the numbers suddenly go crashing down. They continue to spread West, but they're much, much less common. Now, this is because an emerging pathogen had jumped from domestic poultry, chickens, into house finches. In chickens, it's a gut parasite uh, that, that slows the rate of growth, so it's treated with antibiotics. That somehow, and the somehow is that if you want to have a back hard, a backyard um, poultry farm, you, you can have up to 30,000 chickens and, and still have them as a sort of domestic hobby herd. So these domestic ones manage to infect the wild house finches. In the wild house finches, it's expressed as a pathogen in the eye. And because nobody cares about house finches, nothing was done to stop it. And because it's a domestic poultry thing, we know lots about its genetics and physiology. So we were able to monitor it. And this is just our monitoring network. These are people who are members of the Lab of Ornithology in Cornell who send us reports about whether or not they've seen infected house finches on their bird feeders 25 days out of every month. So this allowed us to plot the spread of this pathogen arriving on the East Coast, similar to much of COVID in the, in the US, here spreading with laminar flow with small seasonal fluctuations right across the US eastern range and eventually getting across to Western California. It's a good species to work on because it's a pest in wineries. Uh, originally, this wasn't so exciting because it was a pest in wineries in upstate New York, where the wine has found a, a new uh, bonus for itself as, as hand sanitizer. But once it got to California, it was really quite good news for us because we could be given really good wine to collect house finches from people. It's done something that you really don't want an emerging disease to do. These are counts of house finches coming to people's bird feeders in Virginia, Maryland, and the bottom, Pennsylvania, New York. The presence of this pathogen since it emerged reduced house finches by about 60%. And that's the loss of about a billion house finches in the eastern US. A huge loss in the size of the population, just as it was re you know, establishing and growing. We can quantify the pathology 
This is an uninfected bird with score zero. As the eyes get worse, we get a quantitative visual estimate of virulence and how nasty the pathogen is to the bird and how quickly that's achieved. Now, some of you will be wondering why I'm talking about this. I'm talking about it because it's got very similar pathology to COVID. The ability of the pathogen to transmit, which we can quantify by putting uh, calibrated filtered pea papers against the eye of the finch and quantifying the number of bacteria in them, putting the infected birds in cages with uninfected birds. Transmission occurs for two or three days, up to two weeks before symptoms appear. Once symptoms appear, the ability to transmit goes down and down and down. And eventually the bird, if it's lucky, because we're mainly keeping them away from predators, which would eat them with their brine and giving them food, which they couldn't find if they were in the wild. If the bird survives, it's immune for of the order of about a year, which again, I suspect is going to be similar to COVID. Now that's interesting because a very important paper came out nearly 20 years ago by Christoph Fraser, uh, Neil Ferguson and Roy Anderson said, if we, Roy Anderson, if we look at pathogens, our ability to control them is a function of R naught, the transmission rate, and the proportion of time infections occur prior to symptoms or by asymptomatic infection. And so the things over to the left, SARS and smallpox, have big R noughts, but we could control them relatively easily because the majority of transmission doesn't occur until symptoms appear. In confluence, in contrast, influenza and HIV were really, really hard to control because transmission is occurring before symptoms occur. In HIV, up to 10 years before symptoms occur. Where is COVID? Well, we think R0 is somewhere between three, maybe growing up to four, and a lot of transmission is occurring before symptoms appear. We could look at that in the house finches because we've been able to monitor both the genetic structure of the pathogen as it spreads and to look at its virulence. And there's two key points here. The solid line on the left is the evolution of virulence in the eastern US as the pathogen becomes endemic. And so this is a virulence index, was the average score of a bird over the course of time of its infection. This has got progressively higher through time as subsequent strains have emerged in the population. When the pathogen eventually spread west to California, it did the same thing we all do when we go to California. It became more mellow and relaxed and dropped down to very low levels of virulence. But once it became endemic, competitive, it's like it's going to LA rather than San Francisco, it again started to become more virulent. Again, we can make maps of that, we can do all the genetic structure, we can be nerdy and finally show you some equations and say, well, here's the dynamics of a disease that could be uh, MG in house finches, or it could be COVID in humans, where we have susceptible hosts, asymptomatic but infectious hosts, symptomatic and infectious hosts, and hosts that have recovered who then lose their immunity and become susceptible. Look at the coevolutionary dynamics and just ask the question what happens to the evolution of virulence as more and more transmission occurs before symptoms appear? And if we look at that, we do this as a sort of ESS calculation what is the strain that wins out? Well, this is relative transmission relative to when symptoms appear. If more and more of the uh, of transmission occurs before symptoms appear, then the ESS state of virulence is much, much higher than it is if virulence is expressed with transmission. It's very different than the sort of standard models of evolution of virulence, which are based on myxomatosis, where transmission is intimately coupled with the expression of virulence. Again, if you want to keep something secret, publish it. So we published that 10 years ago and completely ignored, uh, probably because it's on a bird that nobody cares about rather than a vaccine, you know, something that's killing lots of people. Second effect of that is once immunity appears in the population, which you can get either by vaccination or in the case of house finches, by prior exposure, once herd immunity kicks in, then again, that speeds up the rate at which strains of increased virulence appear. So that 
is what worries me a lot about what we're going to start seeing with COVID as we get new strains appearing and which ones are likely to persist in the population. OK, so I'm going to wind up there. What I've tried to say is there are three stages of emer there, there are multiple stages of emergence. Stopping these pathogens early is much more important and economically much more viable than letting them take off. Um, the relative cost difference between doing something to stop them training lots of people to be doing useful things is trivial compared to the huge cost we're having to pay for letting this thing get out of the bag. Um, the three things we need to do are reducing tropical deforestation, controlling the wildlife trade, and training much many more people in ways to make a global virome library and more vets trained to deal with these pathogens. We have to do this as an international thing. Pretending you can do it as a single nation and not need the WHO is the ultimate example of crass stupidity from a crass idiot. I'll finish by just thanking all the many people that I've been able to work with and apologies if I've talked a little longer than I was supposed to. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and again, excellent talk. Uh, I think we maybe have time for one question and based on the question ranking system, the question that most people had the greatest, the people question people had the greatest interest is, what is it about bats that makes them good reservoir hosts? Yeah, no, I mean that that is the sort of sixty-four thousand dollar question. Key thing about bats is that bats have uh, no genes for an inflammation response. Uh, and we know that the huge amounts of pathology in humans is tied in with this inflammation response. Uh, the majority of people who are dying are getting really excessive inflammation responses. So we think that's part of it uh, with, with Cara Brook uh, uh, and a bunch of others. We've been doing cell culture experiments, introducing uh, different types of viruses, Ebola, uh, SARS, into both bat tissue in the lab, and there are very few labs where you can do cell culture work on, on, on bats, but also I, 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 into primates and other mammals. And there, there are other significant differences in, in, in the way cell to cell transmission and, uh, and the location of receptors work that seem to be very different, the, vir the same virus in bats as opposed to primates. So again, it's something we need to do more work on. The beginning of this century, when we started talking about uh, infectious diseases, there were three people on the planet who knew anything about immunity in bats. So you know, if you want a career opportunity, start learning about immunity and physiology of bats. I'm actually going to ask one other question. We've got a minute or two here. Um, what can we learn from the massive deforestation of the Eastern, Eastern New World, now the USA, after arrival of European settlers? Can you speculate on how that influenced emerging pathogens in the 17th to 19th centuries? Well, yeah, there, that's a really fascinating question. I, 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 it's one that also gives me grounds for optimism because you know, I live in New Jersey and it's amazing how well the forests are coming back. Uh, the trouble is they're coming back missing things. There's very little uh, flora uh, of the wildflowers that were there when the settlers first appeared. Very few places you can actually see those on the East Coast. The, we know that one of the big problems in Brazil today is, is that vector-borne diseases are a huge problem. If we go back and look at um, the early settlements and, uh, and conversion of the East Coast, malaria was a massive problem there. And I suspect other vector-borne diseases were, were also uh, big, big problems. So one of the first things we do see with land conversion is uh, th 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 this huge increase in, in vector-borne diseases. Um, we don't have good enough records, uh, medical records for the other things people were exposed to. But similarly, back in that time, we didn't have vaccines for the things that people brought with them, such as measles, smallpox, et cetera. And all of those diseases were doing a fantastic job of peop reducing people's life expectancy into the sort of 40s and, and, and early 50s. So it may well be that we have a different level of susceptibility now that vaccines have done such a good thing of job of controlling the things that used to be big problems for humans. Thank you. Uh, again, excellent presentation.
And uh, I think at this point we're going to shift gears and uh, we are very pleased to have with us Dr. Philippe Sansonetti. Um, Dr. Sansonetti received training in infectious diseases in Parisian hospitals and training in bacterial genetics at Institute Pasteur Paris and later at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research as a postdoctoral scientist. He is currently an emeritus professor at Institut Pasteur and at the College de France and a chief scientist at Institute Pasteur. Institute Pasteur Shanghai. He is a foreign member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. He pioneered the, uh, the field of cellular microbiology by deciphering the molecular and cellular mechanisms of Shigella pathogenesis. He more recently applied similar approaches to decipher the symbiotic mechanisms established between a host and its gut microbiota. His work on Shigella vaccine development brought him close to global health issues in low-income countries, particularly in Africa. We are pleased to have him join us today, Dr. Sansonetti. Thank you very much, Glenn. I hope you can hear me well. Yes. OK, very good. Thank you, Glenn. For you know, I'm very honored by this uh, invitation uh, and it's also an opportunity to thank Tony Morelli, uh, my old friend, uh, for you know, proceeding to this to this invitation. I, I'm, I'm delighted to, to, to be here tonight and give this uh, keynote lecture. So with no further ado, I will uh, um, sort of get to my to my slides. Um, I hope you can do this well. Sorry, with age, I've got a visual handicap and I have to. OK. All right. OK, so this is it. Uh, so what I would like to talk to you about tonight is, is actually some sort of maybe not so new, but actually a new angle looking at the interaction between uh, host and, 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 and microbes. Uh, I think we've been living for decades now with the, a view on, on infection, which is essentially based upon uh, looking at one pathogen interacting with uh, one host. Uh, this is the classical view of infectious disease that we inherited from the Pasteur and Robert Corp uh, time. Uh, but things are getting more and more complicated, and I must say that our interaction with the microbial world is, is getting complex, and, and this is basically uh, the, the, the reason for my, my title, which is Microbes Without Borders, uh, Tension on uh, the uh, 20th Century uh, Public Health Paradigm. Uh, I would like to go through a certain number of, of, of elements, which uh, again, uh, put some tension on the, on this beautiful public health paradigm that was uh, you know sort Excuse of established me, yes your your powerpoint we're seeing the edit view so if you could cancel your share in teams so switch back over to the teams window cancel the screen share that you have right now and then reshare selecting the slideshow uh, okay sorry i'm so you you don't see my slides? Uh, we see the PowerPoint application as if you were editing the slides, not the presentation window. So you should have two different windows to choose from when you do your share. Oh, and that's going to be a difficult task. Uh... I think I think we're probably okay. But like, why don't you go ahead? OK, well, thank you because it's getting complicated for me. Sorry. Uh, OK, so uh, let's let's, you know, sort of sort of uh, I had a dream like, uh, you know, what if uh, the, the founding fathers of microbiology, immunology and, and, and infectiology came back today? And, and this is sort of my gallery of, of hero of the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. They, they 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 did it all in in in, in brief. There might be other names, but, but these are really mine, <laughs> personal gallery. So uh, I, I think they they would they would probably uh, 
uh, observed the extraordinary impact of their discoveries on on the well-being of the of the society, global hygiene, vaccine development, antibiotics, uh, the phenomenal development of academic and uh, industry research, uh, and this is what I call the public health paradigm of 20th century. Uh, they would be struck by, you know, something that, you know, which is the amazing acceleration of of what I used to call the scientific discovery time. Uh, it, it's the time between uh, recognition of a new disease and, and development of tools uh, for its control. And I, I just because there is, a, of course, an, some, you know, close elements uh, with the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, go back to, to Spanish flu, 1918, 1919. It's, it's interesting and, and very emotional to read this uh, sentence uh, by uh, uh, Major George Sopper, he was in the in the U.S. Uh, medical corps in the uh, the end of the 1918 19, 19, 19, and and he he wrote the most astonishing thing about uh, the pandemic was the complete mystery which surrounded it. Nobody seemed to know uh, what the disease was, where it came from. And, and how to stop it. Uh, and, and, and this is really what the situation was. And it basically took uh, you know, many years, like 1933, before Peter Laidlow and collaborators uh, actually could uh, achieve the transmission of flu uh, from uh, human to ferret and from ferret to ferret, and also demonstrate that convalescent ferret uh, were uh, resistant to uh, further challenge by, by the, 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 the flu pathogenic material, uh, which was sort of introducing the possibility to develop a vaccine. 1935, uh, Wilson Smith and collaborators in the same lab actually uh, cultivated the virus on embryonic AIDS. Uh, they identified it through uh, cytopathogenic effect and seronetralization, and at the same time, transmission electron microscopy came and, and they could actually physically uh, view the, the, the virus. So that was, uh, in a way, the real rediscovery time of, of the flu virus. And, and it took, again, uh, one decade before uh, Jonas Salk uh, in the US could develop the first uh, inactivated flu vaccine uh, for GIs embarking for, for Europe. Uh, and, and that was sort of a reference to flu epidemics in uh, 1918, 1919. And 1970 was the first uh, appearance of antiviral drugs like ribavirin and, 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 and uh, uh, Ozel Tamivir, which uh, you know basically shows you uh, what was at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, Dr. The, uh, Cincinnati. Of discoveries. Yes. Uh, I'm really sorry to interrupt you again. Um, the screen share that we have, you'll need to turn that off in Teams. Um, if you can switch back over uh, between windows on your Mac, if you switch back over to the Teams window, you should be able to cancel the screen share with the. Uh, I honestly don't know how I can do this uh, for from what I have on my screen at the moment. What are you seeing right now? Well, I see my my slides on full screen. OK. Um, when you uh, the is on Windows, you can push the uh, alt tab key. I think on Mac it's command tab to switch between windows. Listen, to be honest with you, I don't think I can do this. Uh, uh, well, I, is it's, if you can you just cancel a, a full, we can, we'll share your slides screen, with you if we have a copy. Philippe, can you email us a copy of your slide set? Uh, this is going, I think it's, it's very heavy. It will take, uh, that's getting, can you so you can't really deal with the way I'm presenting at the moment uh, even we cannot uh, see them at all yes. you cannot see them at all
Okay, if you uh, continue to work in that window where we can see your PowerPoint as if you were editing it, I can see that. Okay. Um, but now um, I cannot once the presentation starts because that actually starts in a completely different window. Okay, so what if we, sorry. It's okay. What, what if we do this, uh, which I'm yeah. enhancing it? And uh, can we operate with this only? I, I, I would feel more comfortable because otherwise it's going to take a huge amount of time. Yes, I am attempting to send that live now. Yes, that is OK. All right. Well, thank you. And my my apologies. Um, so. OK, all right. So now, you know, if they, today, I mean, as, as I said, if they came back today, they would realize and I'm not going to get into details uh, into this. Uh, you know the the acceleration in this time of of, of discoveries and uh, you know COVID uh, was uh, basically um, uh, identified the SARS-CoV-2 sequences were basically identified by deep sequencing and and bioinformatics in a few days, and uh, the the global sequence was then made available to the global community in a few weeks. The uh, diagnostic tools became available uh, in the in the weeks after and and the vaccine became available within uh, a year uh, which is something that is absolutely uh, amazing but still uh, they, they would observe some some tension on the system as I, as I mentioned and I tried to identify some of these tensions here uh, first of all the population is changing the aging of the population worldwide uh, in France, for instance, uh, the life expectancy has increased by two times uh, during the 20th century. It in, continues to, to, to increase at the moment. The issue being that the elderly population is the most susceptible to infectious diseases and the least responsive to vaccines. The diseases also are changing. I mean, the, the, there is you know, an expanding spectrum of diseases that are taken into account by modern medicine and, and, and treated by sometimes quite aggressive, especially immunosuppressive of cytotoxic uh, uh, therapies, which make patients uh, extremely sensitive to infectious diseases. And, and, and vaccination, in a way, uh, seems to be also reconsidered at the level of this increasing number of uh, immunodepressed patients or, or, or people. Uh, the microbes change. It is, of course, the issue of the threat of expanding antibiotic resistance. Uh, this is a global extension at the planet level, and uh, all these superbugs are threatening, uh, especially patients in uh, the case of nosocomial infections. The society is changing. There is a threat of vaccination, which is actually recognized by the WHO, uh, which is the extension of vaccine hesitancy and 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 the the. the possible return of preventable childhood infectious diseases and difficulties to implement a vaccine strategy uh, when an emerging pathogen uh, occurs like uh, is the case for COVID and we still have in Europe a, a large fragment of the population which is not only hesitant but extremely reluctant or, or, or opposed to, to vaccination. The behaviors are changing and we heard a lot from the brilliant talk of uh, Andy Dobson uh, about the fact that uh, the Anthropocene in a way the, the changes and the impact of human behavior on the planet is creating conditions for emerging infections. Uh, the, the issue is that uh, in spite of all these sort of new aspects, the, the, there still remain uh, geographic and, and economic inequities. Uh, uh, persisting, especially in the in the south, in in Africa, in Southeast Asia, so the the global pattern uh, has become uh, quite complicated and, and 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 difficult to to handle in a way. Um, let's just say a word about antibiotics because they illustrate uh, something which I think is going to be important in the future and that I will develop in the next step of my presentation, uh, <clears throat> which is the uh, sort of crazy use of antibiotics uh, at the time and it's not just the issue of uh, uh, indiscriminate use uh, in, in the medical and, and, and veterinary context. It's also the fact that uh, antibiotics are used for many other reasons on the planet in massive uh, amounts 
uh, more than 50% of antibiotics on the planet are not used for medical uh, or veterinary purposes, but for husbandry, for uh, improving uh, the, the, the production of meat uh, and, and some thing in, in fisheries and, and, and agriculture. Uh, in, in France, every year, 1,000 tons of, of antibiotics are released in the environment, uh, 15,000 in the United States. Uh, in Europe, it's been banned in, in 2000. You cannot use uh, antibiotics in husbandry uh, and in, 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 in fisheries anymore, but you know, still it's a lot of, of antibiotics that are released. And, and, and the rapid growth at the entire planet level says something like 300 thousand tons of antibiotics being released uh, every, every year. So that is really a threat uh, for, for the environment now, uh, because a large part of these antibiotics are disposed in nature without preliminary biodegradation. So this sort of puts a massive selective pressure on the microbial population, uh, human, animal, environment, and uh, in this area, uh, more maybe than anyone else, uh, the one er world, one, one health concept is, 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 is an essential uh, element to, to take into consideration. So it, it, as strange as it can be, uh, antibiotics has in a way passed from a status of uh, magic blood to the status of environmental pollutant in some instances. And it is not just the impact on uh, the uh, emergence and, and, and um, extension of antibiotic resistance, which of course threatens the antibiotics uh, for the future, but also probably uh, the reduction of microbial diversity. And, and this is really an issue that we have to consider because it might be a, a big issue as much as other uh, reduction in general in the biodiversity on the, on, on the planet. Uh, so the big challenge we will probably have to face within the next year is to save microbes and antibiotics at the cell time altogether, which might not be an easy challenge. So as you can see on the right hand side of this slide, I mean, WHO projection would consider that uh, antibiotic resistance uh, will be the first cause of death on the planet in 2050. There might be a certain exaggeration in these figures, but still, uh, this is uh, an issue that has to be considered. And uh, at the same time, uh, we are uh, witnessing uh, some reduction in the diversity uh, of, of microbes, uh, especially uh, on ourselves, because that's where it's been shown, I guess, first. And this was very nicely uh, shown and is now, is now advocated uh, by uh, Martin Blazer, uh, who published this book, Missing Microbes, uh, a few years ago and, 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 and alerted uh, the, 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 uh, the, the scientific environment about it. So what's the context of this possible decrease in, in microbial di biodiversity? Uh, in 2002, in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, uh, uh, French immunologist Jean-Francois Bach actually showed this uh, very striking uh, two uh, curves or series of curves. One on the left hand side was showing the decrease of inf infectious diseases, uh, which is again the paradigm of the 20th century. And at the same time, on the other side, uh, he showed that uh, there was an increase in uh, a lot of diseases, uh, which we would consider diseases uh, associated with uh, economic development and all the changes in uh, habits, especially diet and, and, and mode of living uh, associated with the, the, the new developing uh, or industrializing world. And these diseases were very diverse, uh, mostly probably from immune origin, uh, atopy, um, asthma, inflammatory bowel diseases, uh, colon cancer, uh, obesity, diabetes. So this is sort of uh, the first alert. And, and, and of course, uh, you can easily uh, sort of introduce here uh, the notion that it's not just the pathogens that are disappearing in a way uh, through this uh, vaccination, hygiene and, 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 and antibiotic uh, use, but it's also uh, other microbes and, and that these other microbes, uh, the rich diversity of uh, the microbial flora uh, is the situation in which the human immune system, for instance, has evolved and not evolved in a world of, of, of of uh, reduced uh, microbial diversity. 
Other examples of this reduction in, in microbial biodiversity, not so many at the moment, and I think this is really something that has to be developed more and more in the future. On the right hand side is this very nice nature paper, uh, 2012, uh, showing basically to make a long story short that looking at microbial biodiversity uh, in the intestinal um, fecal material of uh, uh, children and adults uh, from the United States, uh, from the Amerindian population of Amazonia and from Malawi, basically at two extremes showed that uh, in the US, especially in the young children, uh, the microbial biodiversity, uh, the number of species identified by 16S uh, was half that of uh, children in Amerindian populations who had not been exposed to modern way of life. So the question today is basically, uh, is all this uh, in a way not just correlated or associated, but also has a function of causality uh, in uh, causing these diseases that we have been talking about, like autoimmune disease, like uh, atopy, allergy, obesity, diabetes, IBDs, colorectal cancer and, and, and so on and so forth. So this is in a way uh, the point I am trying to make that uh, our view of human host interactions, uh, of human uh, and, and microbe interaction is, is quite changing. Uh, we still have these classical infectious diseases that are present, especially uh, in economic and, and geographic areas that are victims of inequity in access to prevention and care. We see these re-emerging infectious diseases uh, due to vaccine hesitancy, to antimicrobial resistance, to increased invasiveness of medical intervention and, and, and therapies. And uh, we have these newly emerging diseases uh, that are largely markers of the Anthropocene, of the increased imprinting of human on, on, on the planet, which we consider, you know, and, um, and uh, Andy Dobson gave us this uh, uh, description of the conditions in which they, they occur. And, and last but not least, and this is where I would like to go, is the steady increase incidence uh, of these postmodern non-communicable epidemics uh, reflecting in part at least, the imbalance uh, between uh, Homo sapiens and, and its ailing uh, microbiota. So I would just like to start from there and, 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 and you know, summarized in wide slide, uh, 40 years of, of research in Shigella, as Glenn was, was mentioning. Uh, and I would like actually to quote some of the participants to the major steps of, of this research, uh, Tony Morelli, Claude Parso, Armel Falipon, Guy Tranvanieu, and many other collaborators. Uh, basically, uh, again, uh, it's all summarized on this very complicated scheme, but uh, starting from the right to the left, I mean, the Shigella is, is infecting the, the, the colon, uh, especially in children in, in you know, developing countries. Uh, they penetrate into intestinal epithelial cells following colonization. And I must say that these colonization steps uh, in general in pathogenesis study, especially cellular microbiology, because we immediately focused on the cells and the bacterial behavior towards cells, uh, the colonization step was not always as well studied as uh, the rest was. But basically, Shigella, uh, which uh, expresses this beautiful type 3 secretion system that you can see on the left, is able to manipulate cells, uh, especially initially their cytoskeleton, to penetrate into non-phagocytic uh, cells, uh, to escape into the cytoplasm, uh, to, start, to start spreading from one cell to another by uh, playing with the actin cytoskeleton. I mean, all this was a beautiful period, uh, which actually, uh, for uh, the time being caused uh, or, or led to this concept of, of cellular microbiology. I mean, including looking at the crosstalks between microbes and cells in molecular terms. So that was the, the, the first, and I would say, cell biology view of Shigellosis. But we, we quickly realized that uh, associated to this uh, invasion process, uh, inflammation was there. And, and, and inflammation was, of course, causing disruption of the epithelium and facilitating at the first steps uh, the uh, invasion 
by the bacteria uh, into the epithelium. But we also realized that, and thanks to Shigella, uh, there were intracellular sensing processes uh, which uh, led to recognition of this uh, uh, abnormal event of having a microbe inside an epithelial cells, and, and this led us to discover that the node molecules actually uh, were recognizing bacterial peptidoglycan and leading to the activation of the pro-inflammatory NFKPB pathway. So that was sort of the, 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 the third step after colonization and cell biology, uh, looking at, at, at inflammation. And this quickly extended to uh, looking at the uh, mucosal immune response, but also to demonstrating that these microbes have fantastic uh, ways to manipulate uh, the, the cells and the, the immune system, especially the innate immune response, but also the adaptive immune response. And, and, and this go through, uh, for instance, killing macrophages through apoptosis, or, or manipulating the release of ATP from epithelial cells, which is very, very strong uh, pro-inflammatory signals, or even changing uh, epigenetic marks uh, in the nuclear nucleus of these infected cells, and, and, and basically stably regulating or down-regulating the expression of uh, pro-inflammatory molecules. So I'm showing this uh, because it's always an emotion to review 40 years of research, but I'm showing this mostly to say that uh, in a way pathogenesis is easy because there are phenotypes, there are very strong phenotypes, sometimes very easy to, 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 to analyze, uh, even though the molecular mechanisms are complex, they are, they are quite visible. Uh, whereas uh, life becomes a little more complicated when you start looking or, or, or at, at symbiotic interactions and, and the alteration of these symbiotic interactions. And uh, over the years, uh, starting in 2004, I, I started to try thinking with some of my colleagues about, you know, this sort of transition between pathogenesis and, 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 and symbiosis and how could we adapt the techniques and the approaches that we have developed uh, in pathogenesis to better understand the symbiotic interaction between microbes and host, and possibly, of course, to understand how uh, the dysfunction in the symbiotic mechanisms might induce uh, disease processes and, 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 and induce diseases like the ones I've been, I've been talking about. So this has been some sort of a transition and uh, being in the field of, uh, of uh, the intestinal tract, uh, I of course, and, and many others, uh, and uh, you know, there were, there were pioneers uh, uh, in, in, in several countries, including in the United States in this, in, in, in this field. Uh, the uh, microbial uh, population in the gut is, is very rich. Uh, it's composed of firmicutes, gram-positive anaerobes, and, and, and um, of uh, uh, bacteroidetes, which are gram-negative uh, anaerobes, uh, most of them very extremely sensitive to oxygen. But there are also more minor phyla, minor by numbers, but not necessarily by importance, like proteobacteria, act, um, actinobacteria, archaebacteria as well. So this is a very complex, but uh, sort of a huge amount of microbes, uh, which uh, all together uh, have a, a metabolic activity of about uh, a liver. So it's sort of an extra organ uh, within, within us. And, uh, you know, it's not surprising in a way uh, that they uh, can uh, affect uh, our health when their balance uh, is, is altered. So I'm not going to go through all this, but just to say that, you know, speaking about phenotypes, uh, if you wish to look at some uh, alterations, uh, it's clear that uh, these bacteria drive maturation and, and, and function, for instance, of the intestinal barrier against pathogenic intruders, uh, they are essential for the maturation of the immune system and, and, and its homeostasis, essential as we've shown for epithelial regeneration, angiogenesis also, uh, intestinal endocrine functions, neurological signaling, bone density. They are biosynthetic microorganisms, some of them produce vitamins, 
uh, steroids, neurotransmitters, and they also have an intrinsic metabolic activity uh, with the reduction and fermentation of complex sugars causing the production of uh, uh, short-chain fatty acids, which is a, a big source of, of calories for the gut, but for the host uh, in general. They may also process, process uh, drugs. So, uh, thing is, uh, can one go from this uh, to pathology uh, and uh, to microbiota related diseases? And this is all the concept of, of dysbiosis and um, listed uh, diseases, which I already mentioned. So, uh, this is in a way uh, like, you know, taking the microbiota as a sort of sensor, integrator, and effector of environmental changes. Uh, and, and, and this really goes to, to, to environmental medicine and, and aspects of, of personalized medicine. And this is what I uh, find very exciting in, in all this, even though, uh, you know, there is still um, space for, for, for improvement in terms of uh, bringing all this from the stage of correlation and association to the stage of, of causality. So what is the definition of a dysbiosis? Uh, and I would like to say that uh, it's really going from descriptomics to, to experimentomics. Uh, dysbiosis uh, is in general defined um, with reference to, to the average microbial density and diversity in, in healthy subjects. Uh, so it's often considered as a reduction in taxa diversity, uh, whether it's by classical microbiology or 16S metataxonomics, or reduction uh, of the number and richness of, uh, of, of genes uh, if that's done by, uh, by metagenomics. So you would consider that a dysbiosis is basically a loss of beneficial bacteria plus minus an excess of what we now call pathobionts. Uh, these pathobionts are probably developing uh, because of the reduction in the microbiota barrier by the reduction uh, of, of the diversity. Uh, they are uh, non-harming symbionts uh, or may even play a positive role in maturation, homeostasis of some host functions if they are kept under control by a healthy microbiota. But in case of a degradation, especially of the biodiversity of this microbiota, they get unleashed and can affect you know, pathology. So this is really an interesting area. It's a gray zone in a way in, in microbiology in terms of host microbe interaction that is essential to study at the moment. It's often complex to confirm a dysbiosis because all these bioses may not be pathogenic alternative ecological states in, in, in basic ecology are not implicitly pathogens. There is a high individual uh, and inter-individual variation. So all this makes our life difficult and uh, it's clear that we need, uh, if we wish to demonstrate the causality uh, and the pathogenicity of some of these dysbioses, we need to establish this causality link. And there are two ways to look at this. One is at the bench by experimental systems, again, doing cellular microbiology, provided that you establish uh, good uh, readouts, good uh, phenotype to observe. And uh, also, uh, you can do fecal transplantation uh, in, in germ-free mice and, and try to observe either development of the disease or, or biological markers of these diseases. And of course, clinical intervention uh, is something that is uh, increasingly uh, considered as, as, as a priority uh, in, in, in this area. So in a way, if you wish to put these things in perspective, uh, uh, we, we have to revisit the, the classical core postulates. Uh, you all know about the core postulates, which are established at the end of the 19th century by Robert Koch and his uh, school, uh, which was basically a, a series of, 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 of proposals to essentially confirm 
the pathogenicity of a microorganism, say a Staphylococcus or a Streptococcus or, or Salmonella typhi. I mean, bacteria that were really stars at the time in terms of uh, uh, the perception of the need for, 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 for research. So basically, the bacterium had to be identified and isolated from the infected host, uh, should be transmitted and cause the same disease in, in an animal model, uh, should be uh, isolated again from the this uh, diseased animal uh, as being similar to the first one and, 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 and so on. So clearly all this uh, is very complicated. Uh, if we look at this paradigm switch uh, from a focus view, one microbe, one host, uh, pathogen conflict uh, to uh, interaction of a host with uh, 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 you know, a group of microorganisms and, and, and in a way a huge group of, of microorganisms. So there was an attempt uh, initially by, by uh, Stanley Falco to, to, to convert them to the molecular core postulates, but this had to do essentially with the pathogenesis of, uh, of, of with pathogenic microbe and the, the genes encoding pathogenesis. So we really need to, to build a, a new discipline so, which you could go call cellular microecology, or, or uh, as we 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 call it, you know, creates the sort of uh, new uh, set of of, of uh, ecological core postulates uh, if we wish to to address uh, this uh, issue of uh, uh, dysbiosis being a, a pathogenic entity. So just to say a word about these pathobionts, which are really in this gray zone, uh, I, I would just like to sort of, it's, it's an attempt of character characterizing this, these pathobionts and uh, everything can be discussed, of course. Uh, there are epidemic pathobionts like Clostridium difficile, uh, its growth being facilitated by concurrent degradation of the gut microbiota by antibiotics. Uh, it's usually, you know, what was used to be called uh, antibiotic uh, caused colitis. Uh, others are actually uh, resident pathobionts, uh, like SFB, for instance, uh, which is uh, essential in as 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 a microorganism uh, programming uh, some basic function of the innate immune system like the th17 uh, system we've been working a lot uh, as well as as other group uh, in in the in the world on this uh, on on these uh, microorganisms uh, balance between fecalibacterium prosnitsi and escherichia coli for instance escherichia coli being uh, host uh, in, in the gut and, 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 you know, becoming possibly pathogenic if uh, microbes like uh, Fecalibacterium prosnitsi are disappearing or, or if there is a, a, a large deletion in biodiversity of, of, of the microbiota. In, in Crohn's disease, you see a lot of this Escherichia coli covering the surface of the epithelium, so it probably enhances the inflammatory process, whereas in normal conditions, it's maintained uh, in the lumen or close to the mucosa, but doesn't cause any lesions. There are also microbes like Bacteroides fragilis, Helicobacter hepaticus, uh, Enterobacteria, as we already mentioned, Escherichia coli, for instance, but Enterococci are part of these families. Uh, and there are also ectopic pathobionts, and, and, and this was a bit uh, my idea of, 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 you know, microbes without border. Uh, it's what we now call microbiota decompartmentalization. Uh, and, and this is probably observed uh, in colorectal cancer, as uh, you can see now, uh, at least uh, epidemiologically associated uh, periodontitis uh, associated bacteria like Physobacterium nucleatum, Porphyromonas gingivalis, Parvimonas micra, as being uh, associated with colon cancer. So these are likely to be pathobionts. Uh, and, and the priority now is to develop systems to understand how they can become pathogenic uh, uh, as they reach another compartment coming from the mouth, from the oral cavity and, and, and surviving now in, in, inside the gut. So th these are important questions that we have to solve as much as we had to solve the pathogenic aspects of Shigella and other pathogenic microbes uh, be, be before. 
Uh, child stunting, I will show an example at the end, uh, is uh, one example also like for colorectal cancer of displacement or decompartmentalization of uh, the oral microflora, uh, in this case again, uh, into, into the gut. So, uh, what I would like to come back to and, and sort of try to show the, the transition we had between pathogenesis and, 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 and symbiosis, uh, I tried to make it simple as, as, as the following. Uh, in the early 2000s, we became increasingly interested in understanding, uh, as I said, the, the, the colonization process of Shigella, when what's happening to Shigella uh, when it's uh, uh, crossing the entire intestinal tract and, and starting to survive, multiply and, and cause pathogenicity uh, in, in the colon. And we showed, for instance, how uh, little concentration of, uh, of oxygen at the mucosal surface were important to program the bacteria, its type 3 secretion system to be active and, and, and basically start the invasion process. And as time goes, we've been demonstrating uh, the increasing importance of uh, changes in oxygen concentration in modulating uh, Shigella pathogenesis from colonization to, to, to invasion. Uh, I also uh, stressed, and, 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 and many of my colleagues as well, the necessity to develop reporter bacteria, reporter microorganisms, uh, allowing to explore uh, local uh, environmental conditions like oxygen concentration, for instance, but a lot of other conditions are, of course, to be explored to better understand uh, this colonization behavior of these, microbi these microorganisms. Uh, just to give you a, a, a quick example uh, at the bottom of the slide, uh, a few years ago, we showed that Shigella sonii, for instance, encodes a functional type 6 secretion system, which allows it to basically uh, colonize uh, the, the, the colon much more efficiently than uh, another serotype of Shigella, which is Shigella flexneri. And, and this, as we showed, is actually uh, linked to the capacity of these microorganisms not to kill a lot of different species around in the gut, but to basically kill Escherichia coli. And, 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 and the, the, the tags are very close to Escherichia coli. So kind of fratricide uh, combat in, in, in the gut. And, and this is really what I call now ecological substitution. In a way, Shigella tends to replace E. coli at the surface of the intestinal mucosa, and from there can actually achieve its pathogenic process. So this shows that we can still continue to, to gain information uh, uh, including with the new tools of, of, of microbiology and microbial genetics to uh, figure out what uh, these microbes do uh, in terms of colonization capacity and apply this to better understand the colonization capacity of symbiotic microorganisms. Just to go on with Shigella and, and tell you about this transition uh, with um, uh, Elena Arena, a postdoc from the US, and, and Joy Stevens, a, a brilliant engineer in uh, imaging at Institut Pasteur, they, they established a system of sort of mach machine learning, uh, looking at uh, uh, a sort of uh, agnostic uh, view of uh, Shigella invasion in the colon of uh, guinea pigs, which is a, a good model to look at, at Shigella invasion. So what the, the computer was educated to do uh, was to basically spot the fluorescent uh, spots, uh, which are the, the, the GFP expressing Shigella, and, and you know, average all this information all along the gut. So it, it's really not just focusing on a, a few foci and uh, in general, unfortunately, takes the ones that arrange you, but to, uh, here it's, it's totally agnostic. You don't intervene uh, in, in, in the process. And, and basically what we, we could show uh, was that uh, Shigella had a, a, a target that we, we had not anticipated before, uh, uh, which is the, um, sorry, uh, which, which is the intestinal crypt. Uh, and, and what you see on the, on the top of the slide is the progression of uh, these uh, microorganisms uh, getting 
into and invading uh, the intestinal crypt. These are the, 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 the brownish ones. The, the blue ones are the non-invasive uh, con control, which are kind of disappearing uh, within eight hours. So this basically showed us that the Shigella was, was actually uh, invading uh, the, uh, the, the crypt of, of the uh, colon, and, and we basically confirmed this in human colonic explants, as you, you can see uh, hopefully here, uh, where the bacteria in green GFP uh, essentially locate themselves into the crypt and proceed to uh, further uh, deep uh, invasion of, 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 of these crypts as, as, as shown here uh, as this uh, movie uh, progresses. Uh, Okay, so basically that was the observation. So that took us to the crypts, and and we thought that it might be an interesting uh, area to to study, uh, because uh, the crypts are actually interesting organs uh, in the sense that they contain the stem cells, uh, the cells that are essential for the renewal of the intestinal epithelium. So we we started to look at intestinal and especially colonic crypt in mice and in humans, and 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 made it our sort of uh, uh, model of of studying uh, symbiotic interactions between uh, microbiota and, and 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 the gut, and this was essentially the work of of Julia Negro and and. and postdocs and 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 students graduate students, and and and, and Thierry Pedron. Uh, so what Thierry did was to show that there was a particular restricted microbiota living in the intestinal crypt, uh, which are essentially uh, strictly aerobic microorganisms uh, like uh, Acinetobacter, Delftia, uh, and, and we are still working uh, hard on, on trying to figure out the function of this particular microbiota, which were totally unexpected. We were expecting uh, mostly uh, anaerobic microbes. And it looks as if uh, two major functions of these microorganisms are, are one to, to, to sort of establish a barrier effect against intruders in the crypt, more aggressive microorganisms, and also probably because they are environmental microorganisms to biodegrade uh, toxic molecules like uh, molecules uh, produced by uh, bacterial metabolism, catabolism in the gut, or, or xenobiotics uh, absorbed by, with, with the food, for instance. So that is the sort of things that you can start developing. And, and Julia also showed that uh, basically uh, stem cells were responding to bacterial products, especially to muramyl dipeptide, which is a building block of the bacterial peptidoglycan, and that this interaction produced cytoprotection of the stem cells against uh, aggressions by cytotoxic molecules like doxorubicins or by irradiation. And she could actually figure out, and we could figure out, uh, the, 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 how this uh, proceeded, uh, showing that the NOT2 pathway was actually intercepting the autophagy pathway. And the autophagy pathway was uh, essentially uh, absorbing the uh, mitochondria, which are the major uh, oxygen radical producers, uh, so that the stem cells were pro protected against cytotoxicity by these oxygen radicals, which were uh, massively induced by the exposure to uh, these um, uh, elements like xenobiotics or, 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 or toxic uh, cytotoxic drugs or, 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 or X-rays. So that, that is an aspect. The other aspect, of course, is colon cancer. And with uh, Iraj Sobani, our clinical um, collaborator in gastroenterology, uh, over the years, we've been able to demonstrate that basically the dysbiosis, uh, which was observed associated with uh, colonic cancer, and there are many studies all over the planet showing this now, uh, is actually in experimental models like in germ-free mice, uh, causing crypt branch and alteration of these scripts that go all the way to uh, the appearance of epigenetic modification, DNA demethylation of promoters, which are actually seen in, in real tumors uh, in patients for uh, suffering from colorectal cancer. So this is the sort of you know progression towards uh, an other view uh, of uh, establishing a causality link uh, going basically from uh, 
homeostasis uh, to uh, the, the the development of uh, um, of, um, of 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 pathologies. Uh, sorry, I'm uh, okay. So uh, you know this is just uh, summarizing the, the situation and, and the fact that there are real crosstalks uh, between uh, microbial products and, 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 and stem cells. And, and this is actually a very important element which we would like to develop uh, in, in the near future. We've already started. Uh, stem cells need a little bit of, uh, of oxygen radicals uh, to survive, to differentiate, to multiply, but not too much. Uh, so there is a need for a very, very strong control of oxygen radical production in intestinal stem cells and other stem cells as well, probably. If there is too much production of these molecules, uh, they induce a P53 mediated apoptosis. So they just kill themselves and that's it. And that's probably a good thing because if you put yourself uh, in sort of an intermediate situation, especially if these stem cells are protected by some microbial products, then you find yourself in a situation where you help surviving cells uh, which are sick, which have undergone genotoxic damage. And this is a bad thing because as this genotoxic uh, increased, uh, you get uh, mutations and, and, and you get this uh, uh, sort of somatic mutations that are characteristic of colorectal cancer. So this is an area again uh, that you can establish as a sort of model system as much as we've been establishing, we and others, of course, uh, model system for, for pathogenesis uh, in, in, in the past. Uh, just to sort of finish this uh, series of examples, we've also developed models to look at the role of the microbiota into uh, nutrition and, and metabolism, sort of uh, you know, supporting the claims that the microbiota is involved in uh, diseases programming like uh, diabetes or, 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 or obesity and, and diabetes. So we used, uh, for instance, uh, generated libraries of, of Lactobacillus paracasii uh, so that we could screen uh, function of these symbiotic microorganisms as we had screened functions of Shigella, for instance. Uh, same thing in Escherichia coli and, and with uh, models like this, we could basically demonstrate that uh, uh, some of these major components of the microbiota in the young child, for instance, in the small intestine, uh, are uh, altering the transport and absorption of, of lipids through the epithelium. Uh, and and uh, interestingly enough, the Lactobacillus paracasii does it by uh, blocking beta oxidation of lipids and 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 inducing increase in what's called the lipid droplets, which is the storage compartment for lipid in epithelial cells. Uh, the end point being that there is very little lipid that translocate through these cells. Escherichia coli, we've shown that acetate, uh, which when Escherichia coli is in anaerobic conditions, which is the case in the gut, uh, is produced and acetate does the opposite. It does uh, induce massive beta oxidation of lipids that have been internalized into epithelial cells and uh, basically uh, cause uh, again uh, disappearance this time of uh, the lipid droplets and, and at the, the end point being the decrease in uh, the uh, absorption of, of lipids, at least in these in vitro and in vivo assays in mice uh, that, that we have developed. So uh, this is uh, sort of uh, starting uh, in parallel uh, 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 a study and, and I will finish with this, uh, which uh, is the the Afribiota project. Uh, now we go to humans and, and try to, to address this issue of, of, of causality. And as you all say, it's not an, an easy uh, thing to do. So we've been interested in child stunting, for instance, especially uh, in, in Central uh, Africa, Central African Republic and in Madagascar, where it is uh, extremely prevalent, like 40% of the child population is affected. Stunting is not just a reduced size of these children. It's kind of the tree that hides the forest. Uh, these kids are four times more sensitive or susceptible to infection. Uh, they also have uh, delays in psycho 
motor development uh, school uh, acquisition uh, of knowledge uh, reduction and so on and so forth. So it, it, it's really a, not just a, a health but also a, a society uh, uh, issue in, in, for, for, for these countries. So we, we tried to, to figure out what was going on and uh, we had been discussing with colleagues, especially in the United States over the years, about this uh, famous uh, pediatric environmental enteropathy, uh, which is a, a reduction of the size of the villi in the small intestine, plus uh, a sort of chronic low-grade inflammation that is observed uh, uh, whenever biopsies uh, have has been made. But another aspect which was uh, seen, but not necessarily associated to all this, uh, was uh, this uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that is called SIBO. So the question is now, is this SIBO uh, causing anything uh, in this process? And if it is causing anything, is it uh, essentially causing inflammation, chronic low-grade inflammation that may in a way participate to uh, the stunting process um, or, or is it doing something else that would directly interfere uh, with uh, the nutritional uh, capacity of this child. So uh, what we did was uh, in collaboration with two Institute Pasteur in, uh, in, in Central African Republic and Madagascar, we established a cohort of kids, uh, 1000 kids, uh, including the, the, the controls. And uh, we, we had access to or developed access to, to uh, uh, duodenal jejunal aspiration uh, and, and proceeded to uh, the uh, uh, analysis of, of these, these samples in, in malnourished, uh, extremely malnourished or average uh, malnourished uh, children. Uh, and, and we were surprised to find that SIBO was actually there uh, more than 10 to the fourth microbes per ml, whereas in natural situation, I mean, it's about 100 to, to 1000, but they even go to 110 to the 10 to the fifth or to the sixth in, in some of these children. But more strikingly and interestingly, as I already alluded to, and this was the work uh, coordinated by Pascal Venesh, uh, a Swiss postdoc in the lab with all the collaborators in these two Institute Pasteur, what was amazing is that uh, these bacteria by uh, metataxonomics by 16S were essentially bacteria belonging to the oral cavity. Uh, we also observe a, a decrease or deletion in microbes in taxa uh, producing butyrate uh, in, 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 in the fecal material, but the most uh, striking uh, observation uh, was, was really these, these microorganisms. And as you can see, the ones that are in, in, in bold characters are actually bacteria that we could grow. So it's not just, uh, um, you know, DNA that has crossed the, 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 the stomach. It's, it's, it's real bacteria growing. So massive amount of these microorganisms growing in the small intestine of the kids. And, and we could actually find a signature in the feces with an increased representation of this taxa. So now we have a, a possible diagnostic tool uh, of, of, of stunting, at least seen under the angle of this dysbiosis. So is this dysbiosis actually causing uh, something in the nutritional status? Uh, we came back uh, with uh, our uh, tools that we have developed uh, in vitro and in, in the mice, and we could actually see or show that some of these microorganisms that are overgrowing, especially Streptococci, Streptococcus salivarius, are massively uh, decreasing uh, the absorption uh, level of lipids uh, in, again, our experimental models. And, and, and most recently, we've been able to show that um, uh, what, what's going on in the presence of these microorganisms is that actually the uh, lipid transporter, uh, the CD36 molecule uh, at the apical side of intestinal epithelial cells is reduced in expression by the presence of these microorganisms. And this might be or hopefully is 
uh, related to uh, the occurrence of this uh, uh, of this uh, malabsorption of, of, of lipids, uh, and especially in infants, of course, uh, the lipid um, diet is, is extremely important because the mother's milk is very rich uh, in, in, in lipids, and this is about 70% of the caloric ration which is received by the child is, 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 is lipids. So, this is sort of, uh, you know, I, I try to be honest with the, the, the complexity of the situation, trying to sort of move from uh, cellular microbiology to, to cellular microecology and and try to provide some tools and many other colleagues in the in the in, in, in the, uh, the world are, are doing this at the moment some tools that can be used to validate the causality link and bring this uh, core re-evaluated postulate uh, to this uh, new uh, non-communicable uh, epidemics that we are observing uh, at the moment and uh, with this, I will thank you very much. And I apologize for the technical issues. My my eye, my vision problem sometimes causes me problems on in front of my screen. So all my apologies for this. Uh, and I thank you very much for your attention. Philippe, thank you. An outstanding talk. And uh, you know, don't worry about the technology. All of us have these issues. Um, just maybe ask one quick question. Uh, uh, the question was asked, how do we balance the needs of ready access to antimicrobials with their overuse in many spheres on a global basis? Uh, sorry, say that again. How do we balance the needs of ready access to antimicrobials, um, basically for clinical uses with their overuse in many spheres on a global basis? But, well, I mean, as you know, the figures are not so accurate, but uh, it looks as if 50% uh, goes to, to, to uh, you know, human and, and animal medicine, which you would say is fine as long as uh, people are parsimonious in the way they, they use these antibiotics. But it looks as if in many places of the world, and, and this is the other 50% or even more, uh, you know, antibiotics are used without any controls. I mean, in, in some fisheries in, in, in countries that I will not cite, um, the they, they people, you know, use, uh, deliver tons of antibiotics in, in the sea every, every, every year uh, just to, to increase the, 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 the meat production by salmon and, and, and trouts. So, uh, the, you know, the, we were, I mean, Andy was talking about some, you know, need to some, uh, how could I say, moralize the situation with regard to, to, to the uh, trade of, of wild animals over the planet. I think we, we have to moralize the, 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 the use of antibiotics and, and this has to be done because it's urgent. I mean, we are losing antibiotics at the moment. And uh, again, as I said, we, we really need to check also to which point this is altering the, the, the microbial diversity on the planet. There are, there are work starting uh, like uh, Tara Oceans, for instance, it's an uh, international uh, mission to, 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 to look at uh, the, the, the content of mesopelagic uh, levels in, in ocean with regard to, to microbial diversity. But I think we need to do more about this. Okay, thank you. I think at this point we actually are uh, out of time. Uh, my thanks to both of our uh, excellent speakers today. Very much appreciate their taking the time to, uh, to be with us. My thanks to everybody who participated in our research day activities today. Again, uh, I think it took me 10 to 15 minutes to figure out how to work all the virtual stuff this morning. Um, but, uh, you know, I think what came out, what ended up was an outstanding day. And uh, my thanks to everybody for participating. Um, and again, we will look forward to seeing you next year hopefully out of a virtual situation, but uh, nonetheless, I think things went well today and I thank you for your presence. Thanks everybody and have a good evening. Thank you.